We are live. Good we evening, live. everyone. How's everyone doing out there in the barbershop world? Once again, another series of DYCD Barbershop. We're back. When we talk about back, we're talking about coming back. As many of y'all know, September 13th is the day. We know here in New York City, that is the big day. So September 13th, we're coming back. What are we coming back to? We're coming back to a whole lot of stuff. Because we're coming back to so many things, we have an outstanding panel from people around New York that do outstanding work. They're going to help us understand what it means to come back. Not only just to put your time clock back, which we eventually have to do that also, but we have to come back and what it's going to look like. So I'm going to introduce my my, my compadres here in the barbershop, and I'm going to start off with my, with my main man, Jerry. How you doing, Jerry? What you coming back to? I'm good, and I'm coming back to a nervous wreck. I have no idea <laughs> what's around the corner um, September 13th, but I know we're going to do it together, and for that, I have confidence in um, all the stuff that's coming out, whether it be school, whether it be work, or just life as a whole, and how we're living with this virus, um, how we're navigating that new way. It's a whole lot of things to come back to. So I can't wait to just be a receiver in this great panel of awesome speakers and just to get this information so I know how to move moving forward. And I'll take that opportunity to uh, bring our other compadre, um, who I call the big brother to me, um, Mr. Mike Bobbitt. Mike, how are you feeling about coming back? Uh, thank you for welcoming me back, Jerry. And I was trying to think of how to reduce it in a, in a word, and I don't know. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm wearing all these different hats. So uh, we talked about this early in the week. So for the barbershop folks, I'll say the adult caregiver role is real. So <laughs> I'm feeling that. I am certainly feeling as the, the parent of a now seventh grader amping up, getting, you know, things ready. And, you know, and then as, as, Scott said, you know, I'm, I'm being in the office every day next week. So there's a lot of adjustments that all have to happen kind of at the same time. Uh, and a little bit, I, I, I was going to say, I felt like a shepherd because we have a meeting tomorrow, an internal meeting to talk about getting ready for Monday. Maybe some of the staff are listening today because they're looking for a preview of what we're going to say tomorrow. <laughs> Today's conversation may overlap in some ways and may be different in some other way. To tomorrow's conversation, but uh, you know the, the the shepherd has to try and figure out which way to go. So I'm looking at you, Jerry and Scott, and I'm looking to all. I found a way to wrap out of my finger. I found, <laughs> we're looking to all these uh, panelists and guests to help clarify the the pathway. What what does it mean, and what does it mean on so many different fronts? That's the other thing I'm thinking about too. Is it, it's not just one thing. It's sort of like a reorientation of daily routines and uh, and mindset that I, I, I feel is underway. So, but without further ado, Scott, who we got with us today? I'm sorry, I was trying to get a little stuff behind the scenes out of the way, <laughs> but I'll get it up. But we, you know, we have a, we have a great panel, but before we are, and Mike is talking about all his hats he has. Let's give Mike a round of applause for his new title as Deputy Commissioner at DYCD, all things. That's uh, one that's, of his hats that, that he has. That's not, that's not even news anymore, though, to me. Yes, it is. Oh, okay, all right. It's news you. to the barbershop. So. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. So um, we try to bring a lot of colleagues from different parts of the agency into the barbershop. And so uh, one of our colleagues, I'm happy to introduce, we were just saying this is our first time in the barbershop, but hopefully not the last, our assistant commissioner who oversees the breadth of our compass, our after-school programs, Tracy Cauldron. Welcome to the barbershop. Thank you so much. I feel really honored to be here. Um, and I'm really excited. As you said, it's my first time and first attempt to be in a panelist on the barbershop. But I've been um, an audience member of the, the talks in the past. And so as I, I do feel honored uh, that 
I was invited and I'm excited about sharing what we are rolling out for youth and families for the upcoming school year. We are ramping up um, for uh, after school programming. Um, we, I'm really fortunate to have a job that I'm passionate about. And though I'm expecting challenges, you know, more than more so this year than ever before, um, you know, I, I, I truly believe this is the right thing for our kids to get them back um, to a normal routine, um, back, uh, you know, supporting them with our after school services. And so we are ready to do that and, um, and to roll that out September 20th. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share more information about that tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. And, and I think one of the things that you touched on that I've certainly think certainly been thinking about with my own child and and I'm sure other parents are thinking about too is how important it is to try to have routine and structure. So we've had to adapt and not that we haven't had good reasons to adapt in certain ways, but you know part of this return to the fall is in the interest of promoting that. There are several things that we've got to balance that are in the best interest of our, of our kids and our youth. So I, I appreciate you and I appreciate the conversation we're going to have. So Scott, Jerry, who else we got this evening? So next we want to jump, uh, jump to Jeff. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Now? I'm, I see out that background in there. So go ahead, Jeff, go ahead. I'm good. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Go ahead. Tell us a little about yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, thank you for having me. Thank you for all the work you're all doing. Um, Jeff Tomkinica Sam. I'm the director for the Mayor's Office of Operations. Uh, I've been helping out with the school reopening since last year. Uh, setting up all the testing programs. And uh, today, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the school reopening efforts that we've got going. Uh, one of the biggest things is obviously everyone here knows how important it is to get kids vaccinated. Um, and more important as kind of kids come back to school and go to after school programs and go to every uh, thing that is so supportive of the, their kind of education and their well being. So uh, we are kicking off the school year with uh, vaccination sites at 700 schools all through that first week. So every single public school that has 12 years or older will have a vaccination site at their school in the morning and in the afternoon to try to kind of get parents to come in with their kids in the morning when they drop them off or when they get picked up. But also, if those parents want to just go onto the DOE website, give the permission and consent to be uh, to have their kids vaccinated, they don't have to show up. They can have that consent on file. Kids can go to the schools and there'll be a medical provider there at every school to make sure that they're witnessing a safe vaccination for the kids. And then two weeks later on the week of the October 4th, we're going back to the schools to make sure we can give those kids the second shot. Um, you know, so I think this is a huge effort. And if everyone can kind of talk it up across kind of their different forums and really encourage everyone to take advantage of it, it'd be great. Um, and, you know, honestly, we're focused on the kids, but family members, uh, the teachers and the staff of the schools, we want to encourage all of them to take advantage of these vaccination sites as well. Um, so, you know, happy to answer any questions, but thank you so much for having me to at least kind of announce and make sure people knew about that effort. Thanks, Jeff. You know, there's a lot of things happening around New York City around that, and we're always trying to help support that. So next, I'm going to go to Yvette. Yvette, how you doing? Uh, let me unmute myself. Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing? Um, Yvette Feinberg. I work with uh, Lisa White Consultant Agency that also works with DYCD. Uh, we've been in practice, uh, myself, I've been in practice for over 25 years in HR, in hospitality and um, restaurants, and uh, also in television. Right now, I'm in food and beverage, and um, HR is HR. Lisa and I have been working with DYCD in order to help them to onboard and to retain staff in their uh, programs throughout the uh, city's agencies. Thank you. Now You're I got. I, I'm gonna uh, Jerry. I'm gonna give it to you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring my two final guests, uh, uh, Rodney Pride and and, T and Tessa Wilson. I, I want to announce them, so you can be the other guests. Okay, Jerry. 
I'm on mute real quick. And so um, at this time, let's see if I could bring in uh, Kristen, Kristen Weller. Uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and just what, 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 what are we preparing to hear from you today? Oh my gosh. First of all, I am just like floored right now. Cause when I got the invite to do this, I was like, mm, you must be needing someone else, not me. Cause I'm just, you know, Kristen, just chilling at the council, doing my work, you know, just going ahead. And so I'm so excited to be here. You're, you're all making me feel extremely important. So I really appreciate that. I'm so excited to learn from everything today. Um, so what you're going to hear from me, I work at the New York State Council on Children and Families, and we're a state organization, but we're a neutral body. And so I lead, um, it's called the New York State Birth Through Five Project, and it's a $42 million project over the course of three years. And we're trying to coordinate the early childhood system, you know, from birth to five, you know, including pregnant um, women, including foster parents, including kinship care, all of that stuff, and just making sure that parents, youth, families, children, they all receive the services that they need. And so what we do at the council is we bring together all the commissioners from the, you know, 11 other New York state agencies that work with families and children, and we figure out what's wrong. And then we report to the governor's office and say, this is what we're seeing. You know, this is what needs to change. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the resources from our project, because we talked to a lot of parents around the state who said, I don't know what's out there, you know, um, you know, just help me point me to a resource. So I'll talk about that. Um, but I'm, you're also going to hear just because I have a mental health background, I'm going to talk about balance, you know, and if you need to have if you're if your little one needs to safely eat some Cheez-Its while you take care of you, make that happen. So anyway, thanks thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Kristen. That was so awesome. As, uh, as a mental health clinician on my end, you touch home right there about balance. I can't wait to hear that part of it. Um, I want to now pass the baton to Jose, Jose Lopez. I, you, I'm going to leave the intro to you. I know what you're doing with the Bronx Community College, but let the people know. Speak to the culture and what you're bringing to the table at this barbershop. Um, good, good evening, everyone. My name is Jose Lopez. I'm a um, former Future Now student at the Future Now program. I now work as the college enrollment manager. Uh, my job is to make sure that students with uh, high school equivalency diplomas enroll into college and graduate with their associates within a two year span. Um, today, I'm going to fo be focusing on the importance of students getting back that safe haven space. Um, you know, be doing college at home, me as, as a college student, you know, it's, it's hard to balance doing the work, the baby's crying. So I'm going to be focusing on why it's important for those students to have that safe space again, you know, at the Future Now program or just being in the college um, classroom again. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, we have a couple of guests that's going to be joining us a little bit later. But right now, uh, Scott, if you want to take it home with your other two, with Tessa and Rodney, take it away. So I have the pleasure of, of talking about the new person in Brooklyn coming out is going to rock Brooklyn's world, doing things from the UFT, Tessa Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. It's just always a pleasure. Um, when I had the um, email and I read it, and I was just really psyched because I had the opportunity to talk to Scott just as I've stepped into my new position. So I mean, brand spanking new. I'm a week into this new position at the United Federation of Teachers. We got uh, you I've right been, in time then. Yes, <laughs> I've been with the organization for some time and I've done community and parent outreach work here at the UFT now for seven years. But prior to that, I did a lot of parent activism 20 years prior to that. So um, I bring a lot of background of education activism and working with parents, PTAs, SLTs, CPAC, the whole DOE um, alphabet, I've done it. And um, I had the opportunity to step into the position at Brooklyn where I'll work specifically with families in Brooklyn. And I'm looking forward to um, this conversation because as I spoke to parents across Brooklyn and the city, there's a lot of feelings about going back to school. And I can say as a parent of a, of a 
well, my daughter is now graduated. So I'm now parenting a young adult who's moved out and who's gone into the world as a college grad, but I still get to talk to parents from K through 12. So I'm gonna talk a lot about getting ready for school. I appreciate Kristen talking about balance because I'm one of those people who've been in therapy for many years and I speak very openly, especially to people of color about going to therapy, how it can change your life. And as a person of faith, Jesus plus therapy is the way that I, I get through life. So those are the things that I'll be bringing to the table. Thank you, Tessa. So now I gotta bring, bring to, the, uh, to the barbershop chair, the man, the myth, the legend, the elder, Rodney Pride. Hey, Rod. Hey, Scott. Did I show you that T-shirt? Where did you get that? My grandkids gave me that T-shirt. If, if, if I still got it over in my dirty hamp, I would bring it over, right? He says, the man, the myth, the legend, right? You know, it works great for the grandkids, right? So, you know, Mark, this is what I've been doing, man, you know, since uh, retirement. Uh, several years ago and uh i miss you all there's been no greater partner uh for me over my career than uh, dycd and the, the and the things that i do as a community organizer still in the community and so you know what are we getting back to scott you know me getting back to putting on big big boy pants and stuff, right, you know, and hitting the street, figuring out what are people doing and what are they talking about? You know, Tessa, I mean, this stuff that's going on is like, we really need some FaceTime. And, you know, uh, Mike, we go a long way back. And I think one of the things that you recall, you remember we had the Cancerian and Jera projects at Child Welfare? It, it, it loosely means in Swahili, how are the children, right? And so when we think about the pandemic and all that's going on from a mental health and social emotional standpoint, we know that we as the village, right? Until we know that the children in, in, in the true spirit of uh, the Swahili language is Sapati and Jera, which loosely means that the children are doing well, right? And so it, this, there can be no greater uh, mission for me in my uh, uh, semi-retirement, uh, uh, Mike, than just making sure that our families and children are safe, right? As we go back into these buildings, Tessa, you know, I, you know, our kids have to be prepared to learn. We can't afford another year like last year. And certainly there's nothing more paramount than uh, health and safety. And then, you know, we'll piggyback and layer on. So I'm excited, right, you know, about all of these things that we anticipate talking about, the new normal, the pandemic, how do we feel about COVID-19, some of the things that we've talked about loosely, Scott. Dads take your uh, uh, child to school is, is right upon us. So we're getting ready to, we're, we're, we're full tilt. You know, we're locked and loaded, ready to go. If you go. want to do this, we can do it. And yes. like, well, I'm not trying to be confrontational, uh, you met? <laughs> oh, you you want to be confrontational? <laughs> I don't want no problem with you. Are you are I am you, so you sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought she was 10 toes down with that second job. For a second. Yeah, man, I don't want a problem with nobody. We, we, we got the, the barbershop started early. Okay. Yeah, we this oh, right. Right on, we're right on cue. Let's go right in. Let's go. Let's go. So, That's the so effect of a ride. This problem. People start yeah, volunteering on, and stuff. Like within five minutes of talking to him. So, you know, we're all, we're all, we might live in Queens, but we're all from Brooklyn somewhere. We're deep enough. We're from Brooklyn. <laughs> Not me, and I'm Westchester. <laughs> I won't I'm the hold eyeball it out. I right? will not hold it against you. <laughs> so, with that said, you know, we always talk about, you know, I love the idea, right? You talk about the, the village and taking care of the village. So, we have a village that has to get back to normal. You know, uh, two years ago, March 20, March 20, I think March 19, two, uh, 2019, whatever it was. Uh, we were just moving along and smoking along. You know, the world was what it was and people were, were innovating, doing things, moving around the city. And then Sunday night, it was like an alarm went out to the city said, lock it down. And then that Sunday, everything changed. You know, it was like, a, it was just a huge shock and people were like, well, what does this mean, lock it down? And I, I, I never get that Sunday night call and everybody's calling like, 
don't report on Monday. You know, everybody's the city's closed. And now we're going to go back to the city just as fast and say, <laughs> hey, the city's open. What does that mean to people? One, definitely for children. And, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, I'm a little nervous about transportation. I'm so worried about what that's going to look like trying to get to wherever you got to go. Just this week, you know, taking the Long Island Railroad and the subway uh, into Manhattan, and you know, people are who pe pe people have rights. You know, you know, I can't tell people just because you don't want to wear a mask and you know you want to breathe all on me. What do I do? You know, I try to protect myself. Um, you know, we have people in the subway who, unfortunately, you know, this is their life. This is where they live at. Uh, they're with mental illness things. They're there that's their home or that's their place of shelter. We have to interact and deal with them. But um, so, you know, I, I'm just going to throw it out to anyone who wants to take a stab at it. Just oh, okay. leaving the safety of your home, getting the transportation, what's that going to look like? I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and, and you really, you asked a bunch of questions, which are all good. I want to try to parse it out a little bit, just what, what we think it means to us. And then so we such, have such a great array of panels that can talk about what it means for the children. I'm, I'm gonna tell a quick story and I told it earlier today and I think Scott knows it, but I don't think the other people know it. So, so one, Scott, you said March of 2019, it was actually March of 2020, but it's been so long, <laughs> it's easy yeah. to forget what year this started, you know? <laughs> that is like, that it was more than a year of this ramp up, right? So I remember that in March of 2020, and one of the first things I thought about when this happened was a couple of years earlier, I, I did a no-no, which is I tried to stand on a chair instead of using a step stool or a ladder in my house, and I fell off the chair. So I hurt my leg, and I had to stay um, at home for like two, like two weeks, three weeks at the most, or something like that, right? And I remember I had to meet with uh, my predecessor, the, the former deputy commissioner and the chief of staff, and I had to have a meeting about whether they could assign me a laptop and was I sure I was going to be able to supervise the staff I was working on remote because it was going to be a whole two to three weeks. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I can figure out how to do it. We can all adjust. And then when the same time you got that email about nobody's reporting and we had, what, 500 people at our agency and they were throwing laptops out at people and saying, supervise people, do everything remote and, and you can figure out how to. I was like, isn't this a hoot? <laughs> it was a whole thing for just, just for Mike Bobbitt. And now Bob is fine. So I think it has always struck me as funny, but you know, borrowing uh, that phrase from Governor Cuomo or former Governor Cuomo about being New York strong, I think we've spent a year and a half figuring out you could throw a lot of situations at New Yorkers and they're very quickly gonna figure out how to make it work. So you know, thinking about the anxiety I, I may personally feel and I do I do have a little myself too I'm not gonna lie you know I've had to come into the office between March and then and one of the things I've shared maybe not with the staff but with personal friends is from my accounts they've really worked to keep the subways clean and that was one thing that gave me comfort so I know people were like well I didn't know I ain't going to subway anymore and I actually took a couple of pictures a couple of stations that I had been through you could see people cleaning clean I was like well look this is what I'm seeing you know the city is trying to come back. So I, I, you know, I think through this conversation and other things, we need to find ways to give uh, one another some reassurances. We can adapt. We've done, you can't see my hand. We can adapt. Uh, we've done it before, you know, and, uh, and, and no one is an island too. So I think some of it is through this discussion and, and other kinds of discussions is supporting each other. There's the, uh, there's the administrative stuff, but then there's also just sometimes you need to say it out loud. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want to go to the subway five days a week. Okay, noted. And we'll see you on that subway. Maybe. Yeah. So Kirsten, so that's, I that's think this my is initial take though, but I'm I'm sure other people want to jump in. I see people. Well, I think Kirsten, this is in your belly wick, isn't it? This would be right around with the young people coming back. So go ahead, jump in there. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, you know, um, I'm just, you know, as I've listened to you guys talk so far, I'm thinking about um I'm thinking about the challenge every day of keeping my stuff, my crap in a bag. 
and making and keeping that next to me and making sure it stays in the bag and how hard that is to make sure it stays in the bag, right? Because we're modeling for our little ones and we're learning to fly in a storm, you know? And so how do we keep ourselves together um, with all of this, what can feel like chaos around us? And I go back to, you know, I, on my phone, I started, um, I, I have this um, app where it sends me daily affirmations. And, and, and it gives me an opportunity to sit in that space. Even if it's 10 seconds, you don't realize how long 10 seconds is until you stop for 10 seconds and you close your eyes. 10 seconds is a long time and that's enough time to give yourself a little bit of energy because your gas tank is running out. Um, and I'm, I'm, the other piece that concerns me is um, just transitions for little people, you know, um, going from one thing to the next and the, the real importance of the night before talking about what's going to happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know what? And stuff might happen that surprises us tomorrow, but that's fine because we can do it. We can do it together. No problem can't be solved. Sort of having those, you know, getting them primed, getting them ready, greasing it up um, so they feel like I have a I can do attitude, you know, for the next day. Um, but it's a challenge and I'm just going to continue to stay grounded in, man, taking care of yourself um, and finding out what that is. I don't know what that looks like for everybody. Um, it looks different for everybody because, you know, the changes in your sleep patterns, the changes in, um, you know, difficulty eating and, and maybe feeling like you're in more pain because maybe you're not moving enough or maybe you're moving so much now. Um, I don't know. So just caring for yourself, giving yourself permission to take 10 seconds if needed. Tessa, like you want to, to add to that? Go ahead, Tessa. I, I wanted to pick up on that because self-care has become paramount, right? COVID for me took away a lot of my coping me- my coping mechanisms. So anyone who knows me well, they know two to three nights out of a month, I'm sitting in a jazz club. That's how I coped, right? It's nothing like live music. And when they shut everything down, I didn't know what to do with myself. I felt a little lost, right? And all those things, because I'm a very social butterfly. So all of the social things that I did that helped me deal with the stress of my life was gone. And so I then had to rediscover what my self-care would look like. Um, My circle of people around me, I was cut off from them. And even though I was doing Zoom meetings, I now do some with my family and extended family. It's not the same as being in the room with people. And because I'm a very touch kind of, I'm a high touch person. So people who know me, I hug you, I touch you. And COVID has changed all of that for me. So um, you'll see me um, online virtually saying, I'm hugging you from afar, right? You know, and I'm sending love and I'm sending hearts and kisses but I miss the tactileness of being with people. And so this is something that I've had to talk about with my circle of of loved ones and friends, but especially with my therapist. And I've talked about this a lot with my parents that I speak to because some of us lack emotional language. So we have things going on inside of us and we don't even know how to express it. So especially teaching your little ones to say, I'm not okay and not chastising them for that and giving them the space to do that and allowing our friends and loved ones to also say, I'm not okay. And, and can I give you some time? And then there are also those times where I have to say, I don't have the bandwidth to give you the space right now to hear you. But if we can revisit this tomorrow, you know, I'd be glad to. And I found that as, as I'm parenting my young adult, and caretaking my elderly mother, that I have to give myself time and space because I did not, I, I, I did not know that this was coming, right? None of us knew that this was coming. And so if it means taking a little bit of time extra in meditation, walking, I spent um, my birthday walking the Brooklyn Bridge last year because I could not celebrate. My daughter graduated from college without a graduation. 
We've lost family members without being able to have real funerals. So we have to give people the time and the safe space to speak about these things. So it means being patient, but it also means being an ear. And Jose, I want to jump to you because you, you're right in that mix with, with um, as I call it, uh, generation, I don't know if it's X or Z or, or double A or whatever <laughs> the new group is. I think it's Z. Yeah, yeah. It can't be X because that's me. So I know. <laughs> I know. I know it's after Z somewhere. I know it's double X. A. I'm X as well. Yeah. But you dealing with those those young. Let's not get ages yeah. on here. Say it again. <laughs> Let's not get ages on here. <laughs> no, we get, we want to we want to hear all the perspectives, right? You know, we never know who's in the audience listening too, right? But you that's you're in a special. But I say who's you're in a special age group who can really make their own mindset. Like I said, I, I have a I have a teenager who's in college now, and um, in his perspective about getting vaccinated, my daughter, her perspective of getting vaccinated, is so sometimes far away from what I believe in, and I know you're dealing with that age group on a daily basis. So how is it going to happen with them going back to school and colleges? I know they're what's happening with that. I think that's one of the most challenging thing that's happening right now is students, you know, not wanting to get vaccinated. So to come in person, um, just for an example, we had um, a group that was supposed to start about 40 students. And then once they mandated the vaccine, now we only have 12 students who are actually vaccinated and who are coming in person. So it changes, you know, our ratio with the teachers, you know, each teacher is supposed to get 15 students. And now it's looking like each teacher is going to get four students. And it's, um, it's hard for us to, to manage because we know we still have to support and serve that group that doesn't want to get vaccinated. You know, so how we're going to be able to, you know, teach our in-person students, but also serve the virtual students, you know, still teaching on Zoom, still being able to help them as much as possible. And just to um, piggyback with what Kristen and Tessa was um, speaking about, um, the young kids and their social life. You know, this is my, my daughter's her first year going to school and I'm worried, is she going to be able to make friends? You know, is she going to be able to talk, play, you know, learn, have recess? You know, that's things that I'm worried about because I do want her to have that social life. I don't want, I seen what, you know, being locked in a house can do to someone. And it's, it's, it's worse when someone forces you to stay home. You know, like if, when you choose to stay home, you're like, you know what, I'm going to stay home today. It doesn't feel as bad. But when someone's forcing you to stay home and you can't do anything, it, it, it drives you insane a little bit, you know. And it, it's one thing I'm worried about with my daughter. But um, going back to the students, it's, it's hard because no matter what you tell them, no matter what you, you know, you can show them science and, and, and you know, the facts. But if whatever they believe is there, there's no way you can make them get vaccinated. You know, a lot of our students, the reason why they get vaccinated is usually more because something happened in their family. Either they lost a parent or something to COVID. That's when they get vaccinated. You know, unfortunately, it's sad that it has to lead that far. But I do wish, you know, my generation will get more educated on the vaccination and understand that in the long run, it's gonna be safer rather than risking your life every day, you know? Cause either when I speak to the, to, to, you know, to my students, they always say, Jose, I just don't know. You know, I don't know if I take that vaccination, what's gonna to happen to me. And I always, you know, rebuttal it with, well, you don't know what's gonna to happen to you if you catch COVID. You know, what happens if, if, you, if you die, God forbid? You know, now you don't even have the option to take the vaccine, you know, that's it. So it, it's hard to persuade our young kids. You know, it's, I think it's a, it's a that's gonna be the major issue with students coming back to school. Wow. I'm really struck by what you said. I think your rebuttal is very powerful. And I think part of what we're all dealing with is the pace of change. So this thing happened, we had to adapt very quickly. And then things that would have taken several years happened within a year. So now we have to react to the science and accelerating how uh, how quickly vaccines have become uh, available. And, you know, our minds are still working at the same pace <laughs> in a way, you know, 
there's a there's a king quote that i'm not gonna be able to find in time that's something about that too about like kind of the pace of mankind so we can come up with us technology we're still people you know i mean we still have to figure out in an inter interpersonal way how to adjust the other thing i wanted to say and then I, i'm swinging back to scott is i think jose one thing you pointed to and and kristen and tessa both hit on this is we're all in some ways modeling through our own uh, actions and behaviors for other other people you know and this this expression i do remember character is you know doing the right thing even when you think no one is watching you know whether they're little ones or or otherwise you know so and and one thing i think is really important chris and tessa hit on there is managing the self-care so i think Kristen, when you're talking about the 10 seconds it reminded me when um, before we even had the vaccines when the health department was talking about the core four, you got to mask up and, uh, and what else you got to keep six feet away. And then, um, you know, sing, I will survive and wash your hands for 20 seconds. Right. So if we've gotten used to, I will survive or whatever, and wash your hands for, for 20 seconds, you could be doing an affirmation. You could be doing a lot of things with that 20 seconds, just a moment to reflect, to be direct, you know, why, why not, you know? God, you jump in? My... God, may I, you know, something that, said, something that Jose said that was just so crucial that I just wanted to speak to it because I think we all as clinicians can appreciate this. And that is the skill of listening. Just listening. I mean, you know, as you suggest, Mike, we all have our testimonies about what happened and how we came through this pandemic. But those of us that are adamantly uh, in support of things like COVID-19, right? You just can't, I've just discovered recently that you can't go out and try to beat people over the head, just as uh, Jose was suggesting. You've got to give them a chance to tell their story, listen to them, acknowledge the truths that exist in issues related to history, Tuskegee, polio, and good scientists will marry the facts with that type of history. So that if you dare, you know, attempt to convince someone of your point of view without figuring out how much time do I really need to give them to talk and me just listen, just sit there, you know, it can be difficult for us as social scientists sometimes to do that, right? But it's one of the most valuable things and the most one of the most valuable resources we're going to have as we move forward. I just wanted to add that. I, I just want to echo that. But it's so hard to do, Rodney, right? Because we're all a ball of emotion, right? Um, and so we, we're, we're all in our corners and, and have... Um, our opinions, and we're all dealing with this. And um, and I've I found myself in those kind of that struggle uh, with uh, with my loved ones and and, and friends and colleagues. Um, and um, and I had to stop myself because I felt my emotion, you know, um, take over. And you never, uh, whatever your point of view is on the vaccinations or whatever whatever topic. Or you're, you're discussing whenever there's that emotion, it just it just defeats the purpose. Like nothing is going to, nobody's listening. It's just the you know I'm just going to say what I I need to say, and I'm not going to hear you. And so that's a very important reminder uh, in these times. Um, and uh, when everybody is dealing with this uh, virus and making you know so many um, decisions, um, should I can should I go to work? I mean, there's a, there's a whole um, army of folks who have to make a decision about their livelihood, like whether or not I'm gonna take this, this shot. Um, this morning, I was having a conversation with my staff um, because we, you know, most of our after-school programs are in school buildings. And I'm sure everybody has heard that the DOE has uh, mandated um, uh, folks be vaccinated um, and have one shot before September 27th. And that extends to anybody that goes in, the, in their facilities. And that includes us. And so how do we manage that, you know, and um, with understanding that, you know, folks have opinions and, and, and reasons and rationales for their decision. Um, and, um, and how do we get the work done? 
right? Because we we have to go and see these programs, make sure they're safe, and um, and and supporting our young people. So this is really tough. So I think that's a very um, poignant point that uh, we got to take a deep breath and we got to figure this out together. But it starts with listening and respecting each other. Yvette, you want to jump in there? I thought I heard you try to jump in. You want to say something real quick? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to concur with Tess and the other young lady, um, because for me, I found that it gave me an opportunity, as I said last week, to press a reset button, you know, and uh, to really sit down and evaluate what was really happening in my life, because I was constantly busy, just busy, but busy doing what? Once you got an opportunity to sit down and to set yourself in motion for what it is, I'm sorry if there's a lot of extraneous noise, uh, once you got an opportunity to sit down and go through your mail, go through your bills, find out all these people that you were paying extra money to, subscriptions that you weren't even looking at, you know, um, being a, a platinum card AARP holder, I was able to sit down and really decide whether I wanted to retire or whether I really wanted to go back into the workforce. I knew that I did not really want to get back on mass transit and go back in, the, in these cattle cars going back into New York City. And now I find that I'm back in the workforce and I find that a lot of people don't wanna go back to the brick and mortar buildings. They wanna start doing their own things at home. They're starting their own businesses. They're now using, especially in food and beverage and hospitality, all of those servers who were on Broadway doing all these shows and things, they're now utilizing their degrees that they went to college for into different businesses. I've had friends who just bought a building in Nebraska. They went back home because they couldn't afford to stay in New York City. And four college friends bought a building. And what they're doing is architectural stuff with people who have now moved back. They're helping them fix their homes and you know do things like they reinvented themselves. So as you saying, you know, like you're very social and you're in a, 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 a jazz club and doing things like that. I myself found that I was sending canvases and paint and giving paint parties on Zoom just to be able to have my community. I was also, I learned how to make um, cabbage. There was a girl that like we all, everybody took recipes, their favorite recipes, and they taught them to each other. One night, you know, this group, one fixed cabbage, one fixed, you know, these are the things that we forced ourselves to do in order to get through this pandemic. And the bottom line is, as the young lady said, having affirmations come through to have self-love. If you didn't stop and check yourself, and it was the old saying, check yourself before you wreck yourself. If you didn't stop and check yourself and see what you were doing and how you were moving, you didn't get through this pandemic unscathed. You lost a lot. You lost friends. And as far as the vaccine, everybody is listening through Facebook news and sound bites. Who's doing the research to see what these vaccinations are doing? And not for nothing, all the other things that they've been taking before this, before this vaccine, you know, this vaccine is to save your life. I don't think Hennessy and all them other things that they drinking and eating was not gonna save their life. I'm just saying. A McDonald's okay? burger, right? A McDonald's yeah, cheeseburger. No, <laughs> no, no. You know what got me that Popeye's chicken sandwich? I was like, no, they're not. No, they're not. They're about to kill each other to get that chicken sandwich. But the bottom line to it is, stop listening. We have to, as you said, you have to listen to why they don't want to listen to the sciences. And yes, they do have historical data of what has happened. And as you know, we've been used as guinea pigs and so forth. You gotta get the facts. Don't be afraid of it because if it's, we saw the trucks holding bodies. We saw, we know people who lost their lives. We've got to understand that this vaccine is going to help. These poor children, the generation now that's going through school, they are losing so much that 18 months to them is a long time. That 18 months to me, one birthday, one Christmas, you understand what I'm saying? But these children have got to have the social uh, uh, mechanisms in order to get along with these other children. So, you know, like my grandson right now is married to his iPad. 
You know, he doesn't know about other children. He doesn't know how to, you know, uh, uh, interact with other children. That's not good. They got to have social cues. So you're right. If you got to have an affirmation, have an affirmation, put it on your phone for 10 minutes and stop and think about yourself. Just breathe. You know, my Apple Watch tells me, get up. You can sit <laughs> too long. Okay, you know, take a deep breath. These are the things because we get so caught up in the everyday of being busy and not real being busy. You tell people, girl, I'm so busy. Busy doing what? What are you busy? Did you sit down through this pandemic and think about it? Yeah. I found money that I was wasting on subscriptions I hadn't looked at. And, you know, when's the last time you got a magazine in the mail? Why am I still paying Jet? I mean, not Jet, but you know uh, what uh, I mean. Uh, uh. You know, Vanity Fair. I mean, come on. But that's what I'm saying. You're right, ladies. You know, you've got to have that self-love. You've got to. So I, I want to jump in real quick. Um, I love what Yvette said, but something that um, Mike mentioned earlier really stuck a chord with me, the, the pace. And when I, every time I hear pace, I think of, especially coming from a clinical side, the, the pace of change, right? Um, Scott said it earlier, the change with COVID happened really abrupt in March. Boom, shut down. We have to do something different. The pace of information that we got that said, okay, mask, then no mask, and then this is what we're going to do. All the change happened so quick, and even and so now as we go into a four, there's another big change, and there was, there wasn't a lot of space to just taking the information to transition, right? Um, in in counseling, they always say, be careful when you move forward without any kind of resolve, right? Make sure you acknowledge, you label it, whatever it is that's going on, and then you can start the the healing process or the, the transformation process. And there hasn't been a lot of it's just been like, okay, nope, yes, left, right, now, right? And that's what a lot of stuff has been happening. Um, in that space, I guess my, in taking in this information from hearing what I heard from Jose and even just now from Yvette, just like being able to pause, how do we take this new information? Cause I can't even say we're going back to a new normal cause this is not normal. This is just new. Everything we're about to do is just new, right? Um, there, I don't, I don't even want to say that the virtual world was bad. And I can, I can, I dare to say that even for school is just, where does it fit best? Because we can't pretend that this didn't happen and in certain areas it wasn't successful. So in that space, what does that look like for, for, for all of us right now? Like just on a personal level, going back to work and maybe, maybe, maybe or maybe not having the option of virtual work is mind blowing because I know I did it and I did it well. So how could we not do it, you know? And so taking that same information someone mentioned earlier, I, I was doing Zoom and making cabbages, right? What does that look like in this new space for the stuff that we do? And can we still create that? Because to say it didn't happen, I think it even pushes us back a little, a, a couple of steps back, right? And so that's, it, it's a statement, but it's really a question that I ask for everybody. So yeah, Jerry, I with want, that perfect I, time, I want I people to answer your question, but I also want to let uh, our panelists and the audience know that we are joined by Arlise Ford. Who's yes, I was going to head start I'm for the Department of Education Division of Early Childhood Education, and she's been with us for a few minutes. And the conversation was so rich that I didn't want to disrupt the flow. But this gives an opportunity for everyone to know that our lease is here, and she, along with the other panelists, can uh, can think about and respond to your question. So, at least before you do, can we queue up the video, and then you can even talk to us about the video? Because Jerry and Mike, that you said this is a perfect time talking about. Some the place who are, are getting it right. They have a video that we want to show you about getting it right as they prepare going back. So uh, Dave, if you can queue up that video for us and we'll take the video and at least you'll, you'll bring, come on right after that, okay? Thank you everyone. <laughs> Hi. I'm Elise Santiago, and I'm from the elementary admissions team at the New York City Department of Education. Today, I'm visiting a pre-K program in the Bronx to see firsthand how our city's 3K and pre-K programs are helping three and four-year-old children thrive and learn through play safely. Your child's health and well-being are deeply important to us. All programs follow the latest CDC guidelines and provide safe and nurturing environments for our youngest learners. This applies to programs located in all settings, NYC early education centers, pre-K centers like the one we're in right now, 
elementary schools, and home-based programs. All programs are well stocked with personal protective equipment, or PTE. We have supplies on hand to help protect students and staff, such as hand sanitizer, soap, thermometers, and face coverings. Social interaction is vital for children at this age. PPE allows children to share space, supplies, and devices with teachers, staff, and each other. Classrooms and other spaces used by children and staff are also disinfected frequently, with an emphasis on high-touch surfaces like doorknobs. We emphasize hand washing, sometimes with a song. All program locations, air circulation systems, and airflow have been tested and upgraded if needed to meet health officials' standards. This applies to programs in all settings, from DOE school buildings to NYC early education centers. All schools and programs are asking families to complete health screenings before entering the building. If students are sick, they can stay home, rest, and get better before returning to the classroom. We know this year has been full of big changes for our youngest learners, and we're committed to welcoming New York City's children into programs full of laughter and learning, where they can grow as students and friends. Please check the DOE website, schools.nyc.gov, for the latest updates on health guidelines and practices. New York City's free, full-day, high-quality pre-K and 3K for all programs give children a great start in school and in life. It's not too late to enroll. There are still pre-K and 3K seats available for the 2021-22 school year. If you have a child born in 2017 or 2018 and don't yet have a pre-K or 3K seat, learn how to enroll at schools.nyc.gov slash enrollment or call 311. We hope you and your child have a wonderful experience with your early childhood program, and we wish you a rich and rewarding year with safe and healthy learning for all. With that said, we want to bring on Elise Ford. Elise, how you doing? Thank you for coming to the barbershop. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. How am I doing? Today <laughs> has been a day. <laughs> uh, today is the first day that, well, DECE, uh, that video just, is, uh, just shows you we've never stopped. Um, I think like everyone, the first week out, so that week of March 15th to what was that, the 19th or the 20th, we all had like this break because we needed to regroup and figure it out. But in that space of time in partnership with DYCD, we were setting up these emergency childcare or, or REC centers for our children of our essential workers. And so DECE has never uh, had that break, so to speak, um, that you speak of, Yvette. We've never had the, the, the opportunity to sit and go through the mail and check and see what subscriptions we were overpaying because we didn't have that, that space of time to stop. We have the most vulnerable uh, children. Our, our group is birth to five. And so the social context or the virtual context is not the most developmentally appropriate experience for our youngest children. Um, so we had to figure it out and we're still figuring it out. And so today was our first day back in office five days a week um, and, and walking back into the office with the mayor and the president uh, extending mandates today in real time. And so uh, forgive my tardiness, but part of that is because we were still trying to figure it out you know, with these new mandates and how does that affect uh, individuals? How does that affect uh, parents? You know, our parents have been wanting to come back to center, but how safe are the centers for my children, especially our youngest children who um, are not at the age of vaccination yet, right? If, if that is your option or your choice, um, what does that look like? Are the teachers who is in the classroom with my teachers, are they vaccinated? Are they safe? What are, what are the precautions that you're taking? So um, we're, we're trying to learn, as you said, Jerry, this new and figure out what this new looks like for our birth to five community. What, what do our centers look like? You know, everything that we've taught our children for the first five years of their lives about sharing and engaging and being nice to each other and playing with each other 
it's almost like we are now having to unlearn that. And it's been tough because kids are naturally loving and warm and, and, and they, they want to run to their teacher's arms. And especially in, in those childcare settings, that's what they're used to. You come in in the morning, your teacher gives you a big hug and a hooray. Well, now you can't do that. You know, I can't, I'm used to hugging my friends and, 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 and in Head Start, we have family style eating. Um, and so those of all have been drastic changes that we've had to make in a very short period of time. And our children are, you know, they're, they're resilient, um, but, but they're confused, right? Because now we're saying don't share. And, and uh, for these first five years, everything has been about sharing and being kind and being nice. And, and now, now, now you're saying I can't, you know, I can't go and em embrace my friends. So uh, we're still moving. We're still trying to figure this out. We are adjusting to our new, um, you know, throughout the pandemic or throughout the early part of the crisis, we had to figure out how to engage parents. And so we kept doing things um, much to what you shared, Yvette, is like figuring out how to do this virtually. We had parent portals and we had to shift all of our meetings to an online context and, and be mindful that even in that context, um, we did our best to hit the mark, but a lot of these platforms are not in languages that many of our communities speak. And how do you figure out how to get a translator and, and just connect all the dots and do all of that? And how do you translate the materials that we're trying to get across for this virtual context of learning and, and make sure that it's reachable and accessible to all of the communities that, that our early childhood education communities serve? Um, you know, uh, you said it, one of you said like did we do it did we do it our best or did we in some settings this worked in some settings it didn't work and so in some settings where there was one device for an entire family so now those families had to figure out who gets the time on what and so if you have a school a school age kid you know like a kindergarten to five then the priority goes to that kid but how do you then manage getting your birth to five-year-old on with their teachers, on with their classmates. So again, just trying to juggle and figure all of this out in this context has, has been the story of the resilient and, and the story of those who have figured it out and the story of those who have not figured it out and still managed to survive and, and, and figure it out the best way we could. Um, so we're excited that we are back uh, five days a week to some degree. We do have concerns. We have a lot of Today we did an exercise called uh, what's our temperature or what's our, our climate like. And so some of us had a cloudy day today and some of us were bright and sunny. But, you know, for some, um, today was the first day that, that we've seen people that we haven't seen in over a year. And, and, and how did that feel and what did that look like? And as we gear up to start school on Monday, many of our children, our birth to five children, have been in session since July 1. But the the class sizes will likely will likely increase beginning Monday. And so what does that look like? Uh, creating a new and a space where parents are used to taking the children all the way into the classroom and doing the hand washing and helping them pick put their coats in the cubby. We are now trying to figure out how do how do we do that in the safe space and a space that still feel welcoming. Um, but being mindful of health, health and safety precautions. And so we can't have the mass entry that we used to having come in and everyone just kind of, you know, gets into the classroom and, and, and congregate and do it all. Um, it, it's a work in progress, but we're, we're excited about where we're going. Um, we're excited that our children are coming back into that setting of, of being, even if they can't hug and love each other the way they're used to, they can at least engage and see their friends. And so that's what's really, really exciting for us. So I'll pause there because I can keep going. <laughs> uh, that was great. And that was, you know, it was definitely earful. And, and, you know, right on point where we're talking about of how do we how do we do this, this new normal? Well, like, as Jerry said, let's not stop calling that. How do we do this new thing that we're going to be, this new lifestyle we have to, to interact? And you know, definitely it's going to be hard enough uh, teaching our young people how to do it. Uh, and then once again, moving up to our high schoolers and our college students, but um, but even us uh, and most of us on here supervise many other people uh, that we have to 
have the strong face on for and be able to help them manage their stress level. I was just talking to um, one of my providers today and, and I, was, I was like being, I had to be a therapist for, for about an hour today and try to keep them strong uh, so they can keep their program strong. So how, how, how are you all gonna do that? Because we all are having, um, gonna have a task uh, Monday morning to help manage our own people. And how is that going to look? Anybody? I, I spoke to this a little bit and, and, uh, and Tracy actually was talking earlier about how she just met with her team. So um, in the beginning, when Jerry asked me how I was, how I was doing and how I was feeling, I said, I felt a little bit like the shepherd, like you're looking for what direction to, to go and bring your flock along with you. Um, I, I think with colleagues and with, with staff and with other adults, so many panels have already talked to the importance of, and we've talked about this in other sessions too, where you get your information from. So adults can go and get the information that they, that they need to and try to make uh, intelligent decisions for themselves and their, and their family. So I think part of it is making sure people have access to the information and you hope people will make good decisions. Um, but then another piece of it, I think it's what you said, Scott, too, is just being able to listen to people and, and be there for them if they need some uh, help as we all do thinking through certain things, you know, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to belabor that point or, or my time, but I think some of the stuff uh, and maybe Tracy, you want to jump in some of the stuff you're saying about how your meeting went and you know, if there's rules and regulations, this is what's expected of us. And people um, would rather say, yeah, put your, your, your big boy pants on about certain things and people need to, work through what they think that means from them once they what it means for them once they have clarity about what it is that's expected you know i mean i mean i could go on you know when when i had the chance to get my mother and my uncle vaccinated i got them vaccinated right away when i had the chance to get myself vaccinated i got myself vaccinated right away when the vaccine became available to 12 plus i remember that came around the time we did the the youth vax barbershop i was leaning in I'm like, am I going to get my job? And, and, and I did. I did. And now she's vaccinated. And, and for me, those are some things that I don't have to worry about as much because of, I'm not going to say the research or relying on the research that others did and making what I think were intelligent decisions. So your scenario is about being on the subway and you can't control what other people are doing on the subway, but you can control what you're doing on the, on the subway. And then there are decisions that you can make, you know, you know, people have been given some, uh, I mean, I'm speaking parochially now, but people have been given some flexibility as to when to come in. So if other people are listening and, and their employers will give them some flexibility about when to come in, if you can avoid rush hour because you go in a little bit earlier or you go a little bit later or your family situation allows you to be a little bit flexible about when your commute is and you think that that's a smart and, and healthy decision to help you manage what your week needs to look like. Those are, those are decisions that individuals can make. Go ahead, but, but got to mute, got to mute. Oh, I'm sorry, I have a question. Uh, are you noticing if your staff seems prepared to come back? <laughs> if, 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 I'll let somebody ask, we had a we had a, a email chain today. About yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I will give a short answer and then I will open it up for others to say in their respective uh, realms. There is information that uh, we anticipated people n needed to have. And so colleagues have generated that. There's an FAQ. People have the ability to, to review the FAQ and maybe a lot of the questions will be answered. So I can't tell you until tomorrow, but one of the reasons why we wanted to meet my group anyway internally tomorrow is to see even after reading this, do people have questions? And one of the things that arose that I think Scott was laughing about is the FAQ deals with a lot of practical, like how do you do this? And what is the response to that? And what does this mean? But people have been expressing that they're just anxious. And I knew that people were feeling anxious, but one of our colleagues likened it to, and this is not how I think of it, but this is how my colleague likened it. He likened it to, 
the first time he came back to the office after 9-11. And I was not thinking about it that way or that other people would be related to the situation in that way. But now knowing that he thought that and felt that, and maybe some other people thought that and feel that, um, you know, in addition to the 20 seconds where you're doing an affirmation while you're washing your hands, we got to figure out a way to spend a little time just because we're human beings. So I know people have to go in next week because they have to go in next week, but I have to try to create some space to let people I know, at least one person is feeling that this is like coming back to the office after 9-11. And I don't, I don't know until we have the discussion how, and, and people might not want to say, maybe they'll want to say later on to appear to a supervisor. So I, you know, I think we have to try to be humane with each other uh, in the face of, you know, rapid change and stop, change, start. And here's the new thing, you know, we have to figure out ways to continue to, to do that. And the last thing I'll say, and then I want to shut up and hear from other people is, our lease was just gave a wealth of information and revealed a lot that I think we may either take for granted or not think about a lot. You know, like I, right, because we're DYC and we work through nonprofits, I think we'll hold up. Nonprofits are always looking out for the best interests of uh, of New Yorkers, and uh, and without and she wouldn't toot her own horn, but listening to her objectively, I, I think it's important. Uh, you know, we bring a lot of city and state and other folks to these conversations so that whoever is listening can see, look, man, the, 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 our colleagues are, are busting their humps too, trying to do all they, all they can. I can only imagine as educators, when you spent years training for this environment where, you know, birth to five and kids want to hug each other right away. And now you have to figure out on the fly <laughs> how to, not just move them through those spaces, but continue to have these developmental experiences still take hold because eventually they're going to need to be adults and they're gonna to have to have learned these lessons even in an adapted in environment because of the kind of New Yorkers we wanna to continue to support them growing into. It's extremely tough. It's extremely tough for all of us. You know, Tracy, you might wanna uh, weigh in about how we try to support the after school programs. I'm sure they're going through a lot of the same stuff. It's not just the logistics, it's the the humanity. Little people, adults, you know, and 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 keeping some bandwidth to 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 deal with that kind of stuff. You know, and it, and it's exhausting, frankly. It really is. And not that we don't want to do it and we will do it, but I know that it is exhausting having to do it. Yeah. I mean on a good day, child care supporting young people is a hard job. Um, and then you, you put a pandemic on top of that. Um, it is extremely, extremely um, hard uh, for folks who are passionate about what they do and want to do a good job and, and then have to battle, um, you know, a, a pandemic on top of it. Um, like our lease uh, team, uh, we never stopped. Uh, we, we, we worked in partnership with the Department of Education to provide um, the rec center, the learning labs, um, uh, summer programming. We just finished summer camp. Um, so we continued to do programming. We pivoted back and forth between in-person and, and virtual services. Um, and we ended the summer with full um, summer camp in-person services to a, an increased number of students than we've ever done in a pandemic. Um, and so we saw the, um, you know, the stress that it put on the system. Um, we saw people uh, up and, and just leave, you know, um, because they, it was just a lot. It was an emotionally, um, challenging, physically challenging. Um, and, um, and so we saw the stress on the, the entire system. Um, and so there, there's concerns about, you know, uh, how many folks are returning to this work given what they have been through the last year and a half. Um, and uh, we, were, we were faced with a staffing shortages pre-COVID and now um, going in, um, you know, during a pandemic um, and all the programming that we provided during the pandemic, um, 
you know, I have concerns about, uh, you know, are we going to be able to provide as, you know, as much services that we are funded for because there's going to be these staffing shortages um, due to the pandemic. Um, and so we're recognizing that and we're working with our providers to, um, you know, Yvette is uh, a is helping us, um, you know, uh, to work with our providers to come up with strategies to recruit um, and retain, which is the big thing. It's like, how do we retain these folks? How do we um, support them um, when they they're doing the work so they stay in the field? Um, it's an important aspect that we have to focus on because we've seen, um, you know, this take a toll and the most passionate people, um, you know, who would just say it's, it's, just, it's just too much. I can't do this anymore. Um, so it's a real concern um, for my staff who are doing the work as well. It's the same thing. You know, we keep asking them to do more and more um, and, um, and change and pivot. And, um, you know, we got to recognize uh, the toll on them as well. And so within my unit throughout the pandemic, we've been taking the time to just breathe. Um, we've had um, uh, meetings where we're not talking about work. <laughs> we're talking about the people who do the work. How are you doing the check-in? Um, and, and we were just planning another thing, um, uh, unit event. Uh, where we were going to get together and just, um, you talked about that, I think it was Yvette who talked about the painting, this, what is it, the sip and paint thing. We were going to just do that um, virtually, um, just because uh, it was it was a while before we've all been together, and I have a, a very large staff, and then we got the notification that we're coming back to work, and so we're kind of putting that on hold, because now we got to focus on how is next week going to have, you know, be for us. Um, how are, you um, you know, how are we going to support our staff coming back to work that week, uh, you know, because we went from zero to 50. We, you know, we went to not being in the office and we went to from one day a week and now we're five days a week. There was nothing in between. And so, you know, um, it's it's there's a lot of anxiety about about coming back to work and recognizing that um, and um, and just keeping that at the forefront because I think as a, as a manager or a leader of the unit, it's my job to make sure people are okay. It's not, it's, you know, so they can do the work. It's not about, you know, how much work they're doing. Um, and, um, and I always make that uh, my focus to make sure that people who are doing the work are able to do the work and um, and feeling good about doing the work. And so checking in is just so, so important all the time, but especially when we're dealing with, um, um, you know, a crisis, which is what we are dealing with. And I, I just wanted to uh, make a point. Uh, I think Mike said uh, one of his staff members compared going back to work to 9-11. And if you haven't seen the Spike Lee documentary, who's doing that kind of comparison and, um, and talking to folks, um, about the pandemic, uh, about 9-11 and how New Yorkers got through it. Um, it's both, you know, I, I love Spike, you know, I don't know how he finds information that you've never known, even about 9-11 in this documentary, he brings things up about, um, you know, how New Yorkers uh, banded together and supported each other and got through 9-11. Um, and, you know, things that I hadn't heard before, but he's doing the same thing about the pandemic. And so I encourage everybody to, to check it out. Um, it's a series, it's a number of um, episodes, um, but um, it's, a, it's a great point of, you know, how, um, you know, we have been through a lot, you know, it's been, been 20 years or so, yeah, 20 years since 9-11. Um, and it's even the folks that he was interviewing um, in the series still got emotional and choked up and still are dealing with the after effects of 9-11. And now they're going through a pandemic. And so, you know, it's so important that we're sensitive to people's emotional state. Um, and, um, you know, for folks who work for you, who, who are folks who are in the field, um, yourself, um, you know, your family and friends and loved ones. So, yeah. No, I think that was great. What um, Tracy said, just uh, one of the things that sat with me, just just checking in on people. And, and I think the area that's really been just coming back into my spirit has just been the pace of change. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, like with 
in, with DYCD, Department of Youth and Community Development, uh, I would say a couple of months before the pandemic, and even in the pandemic, we were doing this theory of change, right? And we were doing a lot of cultural shifts within our own agency. And we knew in advance, this was gonna be a two, three year thing. From a national perspective, there's been maybe two to three hard shifts within a 12 month period, right? And that goes against all natural behavioral norms. And so when I, when I think about the, the pace of change and what that looks like, I've also realized that this new that we're going to is gonna look different intergenerationally, right? And so for some people, um, maybe in the older category or in the professional field, virtual was a godsend, right? Like it, this changed the game and I'm, I'm good and I'm great uh, for depending on what youth category you're in, um, it was the worst thing ever. And then when you add in the vulnerabilities that COVID exposed, right? And I'm talking about from a national level, the vulnerability of class, the vulnerability of race, the vulnerability of, of social connectivity. You know, for, for some youth, depending on what neighborhood you were in or what um, wealth class you were in, maybe it worked really great. Maybe it didn't work at all. I can tell you some people in certain neighborhoods, uh, I think, um, or at least mentioned it, they had one iPad to share amongst an entire family. We're talking about a community family, right? It wasn't even like your, your typical mother, father. You're talking about aunt, uncle, aunt, and then a couple of two nephews and kids that you adopted, right? What does that look like? And so the, the, the pace of change and how do we speak to that change as it relates to coming to find out that it's going to look different depending on what group you're in, right? Um, we have COVID babies now, right? And I say that, um, even though I say it with a smile, that some people, the only reason why they didn't take maternity leave is because I could work remotely. Now it's like, oh, I'm not coming back. So <laughs> in that space, I would love to hear from um, Kristen or, or Rodney, what does that look like across an intergenerational or even class and wealth? Jerry, Jerry, you, 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 you uh, 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 introduced a couple of very interesting topics. This last one in particular, you know, when I hear everybody talk, I try to look through the lens of where I'm at, right? Community and the work that we do with men. And, and, and I can say on a number of different levels, right? Uh, unlike anybody on the, uh, on the call, because, you know, when you're somewhat unattached, you have the liberty to say what you want, when you want, how you want. And, you know, and that's just the way it is, right? And so I can tell you from the community's perspective, at least I hear your passion. Wow. And I'm glad you are where you are. We need you to be able to do what you do, right? And I would say that as a community planning board member, somebody who's involved with community district education, people who are involved in civic association, you know, one of the things they're saying about education that somebody said something about resiliency earlier, right? So we as a people, and our children and everybody, all cohorts and stakeholders have the ability to be resilient and then pivot. Resiliency and then pivot, right? So, so for, for me as an older um, uh, professional, right? You had to tie me down for training, right? Training on what, right? You know, technology, you have to know this. That technology came in handy. Mike, I can give you 40 hours a week now, right? In two hours. Really, you know, from working at home, right? You know, so, and, and I, I don't know how you folks that are going back to work are going to be able to manage that because on an eight hour day, you spend half the day at the water cooler with gossip, right? Or maybe maybe you run away from Mike all day, right? Because if Mike see you, I need to see you for, I need to, every half an hour, right? I need to see you. And so your whole day is spent uh, dodging and avoiding Mike, right? So, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of different levels with this. People in the community all this are saying that some good things came out of the pandemic. As you suggest, issues of device and broadbanding was a real shame and an issue. However, dads and men, all hands on deck, right? So now mom had, you know, somebody else at home where parents in general, we in the community believe parents were never doing enough, Tessa. We, you know what I mean? So, you know what I mean? That whole question about what am I going to do? I'm not a teacher. I'm not really an educator. Well, you have no option. The child has to learn. You have to get them up with routine at the same hour and go over and sit in a corner and be able to figure out this is going to be your workstation. And you're going to take out your book 
and you, this is your hour for reading, and this is your hour for math. And family had to figure out. Uh, my my grandchildren, right? You know, they call me Big Pop. My job was to call to to tune in to Zoom or uh, uh, Marco Polo, and FaceTime and and do the reading. And that broke my granddaughter's heart because she she's so used to playing with me, but now I have to be serious. No, no, you had homework, you had a responsibility. And so that's the lens that I see the thing from the community. We learned some things through hybrid models, when you can go home, when you can uh, work from home, when you can learn some things, you could still go to the zoo uh, remotely. Right, you can you can do some research remotely. So it's the fondest wish of the community that there's pieces of the pandemic that we actually hold on to, right? That we don't necessarily throw that away because we figured out some things, right? Nothing replaces face to face from a social emotional standpoint, Arliss. I agree with you, especially for our younger people, right? And to a great extent for the working crowd as well. But you know, as a as an older group, we have choices and we have options, and we and we have we can be we can make informed decisions. So, so Jerry, you know, this conversation you can go. What did it look like for uh, um, what is it Gen Z? That group between nineteen and twenty five. If you had a chance to look at them, they couldn't go to the club. Right. Even Tessa couldn't go to her favorite jazz spot. Right. The older crowd didn't necessarily want to go anyway. Right. You know, so, so we, we are home. We don't want to be in that kind of uh, super spreader type of environment, knowing that you have issues at home. We as men, we can't wait to do dads take your child to school so that we can have our own unique kind of conversations where we can go face to face. What are you thinking about, man, as the head of your family? You know, that whole question about, you know, whether or not you should take the vaccine or not. There's a unique kind of conversation that's, you know, that's not built for everybody, right? You know, but one in which we believe that out of love, we can say that we think you're on the wrong side of this football, right? And so, you know, if, if you ask this burning, right, what it looks like, and we're gonna continue those conversations, Jerry, as we go deeper into the community around what this means to different subsets, cohorts, stakeholders, you know, and, and figure out where are some of the best practices and how to find the good in the things that went kind of crazy, right? So we don't wanna like lock in on, oh, the sky was falling, how do we, you know, recover, that kind of thing. You know, resiliency, the thing that comes to my mind is resiliency and the ability to pivot. Let's get Kirsten in. And I know Yvette, you have to go real quick. Um, so Kirsten, let, let's, well, you know what, Yvette, why don't you say something and let Kirsten go go that way? Because I know Yvette, you have to go. You want to say something real quick? Totally. Yeah, totally. I just, I just want to just, um, speak on what he just said about resiliency. I just want to ask, how many people still washing their groceries when they bring them in now? <laughs> <laughs> wipe this stuff down, right? Your mother's taught you from little. Wash your hands, keep your finger out your nose, and you would always survive, right or wrong, okay? So the thing about it is, you have to be resilient and pivot. You're 100% correct. This is a new normal, but it's not normal. This is a all new for us. And the thing about it is we got to stop listening to sound bites and really do the research and find out what this really means because it doesn't stop right here. The other generations are really going to suffer if we don't get this right. Because they, they, remember at one time there was no child left behind. How many children really got the education that they needed when this pandemic was going on? So, you know, that's where my thoughts are. And that's why I hope that we can really tap into what are we going to do with those children when the time comes and they're not up to level to where they should be for their age group and the classrooms that they have to go into. That's what I'm, I'm really worried about because children, they're not like us, okay? They, will, they won't know what they need to know at the age group that they should be in. So, you know, with that, everybody have a blessed week and be safe and you know wear your mask i'm you know 
Don't stay in crowds and so forth. Be smart about it. Don't get crazy with it. Okay, everybody have a good evening. Thanks, Yvette. Yeah. Thank Kirsten. you. Hi, Kirsten, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, wow, I have so many nuggets um, of information that are just flying through my head. Um, you know, first, just, you know, following what Rodney said, and really people have talked about resilience. You know, we found our strength where we didn't know there was strength. Um, the bummer about that, I think, is that we aren't always strong because we're choosing to be. We're, cho we're, we're strong because we have to be in a moment. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, just I want to share just some sort of scientific point of view here because we're talking about what the return is going to look like and how it might feel. And so um, when I went back to work, you know, we go to work like twice a week and then we were told we all had to come back and that didn't happen. So now I'm at work twice a week with a handful of folks that are there with me. And I was sitting there and I thought to myself, I, I'm in like a cubicle farm. And I thought to myself, I thought I worked at the council, but clearly I work at the stock exchange because it's so loud in here. I can't focus on anything because I heard every single conversation that was going on. It was wild. And I thought about it and I used to work in brain injury um, several years ago. And I thought my brain isn't used to this. Like we're talking about the emotional impact, but then I was like, what's happening inside? My brain isn't used to it. My brain used to work hard every day to ignore all those other conversations. And my brain hasn't learned how, to, has to learn how to do that all again. So my brain has learned that six feet is a comfortable distance. So now going back out into the world, my comfortable distance is going to be infringed upon as I walk through the grocery store or wait in line at the grocery store or, you know, get on the bus or I'm in the elevator. So I, again, just think about the patience that I have to have with myself as my brain is learning this again, you know, but our brains are flexible and, it, and we're capable of new learning, but it's a struggle, you know, in that happening. And so, you know, when um, Mike was talking, I think, and you were, you know, talking about, some of your team members and, and what they can do. And I thought to myself, what did I do? And I, I don't mean to make this so self-focused, but telling our own story, I guess, is a good way to, to share um, what works. And so I was like, what are my resources? What are my flexibilities? And so I got, you know, I just, I put on some noise canceling headphones and I just started listening to podcasts all day. And you can do that on your phone. You can look Pandora up on the computer if you're an office worker. So it was like, what are other folks, like the people that work around me and the people that work with you, what are their resources and where are their flexibilities that they can add in some of those accommodations to help support them while we get back to the norm, new normal? It's almost like, we all need a, a set of crutches in a way to help us sort of have like a prosthetic, I guess, you know, to help us get back. And, and, and then I was struck, Mike, by what you said about um, a team member of yours who was experiencing, you know, feeling like returning to work after 9-11 and, you know, being scared of being unsafe creates trauma. And when trauma happens, you look at fight, you look at flight, you look at freezing, you look at fibbing, you look at all of those things happening and acknowledging when you're doing those things, when you might be seeing young people doing those things. You know, I, um, Yvette, I think is, is not here, but I thought, I think about young people on their phones and I'm thinking, man, is that, is that, is that flight? Are, are they trying to go somewhere else? Are they freezing? What is that there? And so I just, um, I just say all of that to say that I think returning to the normal again, returning back into the world again, is going to take patience with ourselves, patience with other people, and just acknowledging the importance of those authentic relationships with, with folks in our communities, um, because I don't see enough of that from where I sit. Um, 
in a position with the state. I, I often see people in positions of influence being more insulated than folks that are working directly with families. And I think that's a real shame. And so I think for things to start to change too, um, I applaud Tracy who's saying, you know, I'm, I'm a leader here, but it's my job to make sure that the people that are working with me are okay. And, you know, that's how, that's how good change um, occurs. Zay, you wanna jump back in here? I wanted to, oh, I did raise my hand. I wanted okay. to pick up on this because this has a lot to do with um, the type of leadership that we have. And um, I love dropping resources. One of them, um, I'm a, a big fan, I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown who talks about dare, dare, dare to lead. And she talks about being vulnerable. You know, vulnerable leadership is true leadership. And choosing not to put on the armor, right, that that's really the cowardly thing to do. And so one of the things that I've done in a lot of my conversation is that I've become a lot more transparent. I've become a lot more vulnerable. And my relationships have become a whole lot richer as a result. So there are times where we, 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 we keep talking about being resilient and being strong. But there are times where I had to say, I, I can't be strong. And right now I can't do resilient. Um, it, it's just too much for me. And being honest in that way, that's something I wouldn't have never have done prior to this because in my family, the way in which I was raised, that would have been considered weak, right? And what I found is that when I become vulnerable, I've given people the space to help me. And I've in kind been able to help them. So I think one of the things that we have to be careful because we've all experienced a collective trauma, right? And here we are coming up on some more variants, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, the end of the Afghanistan war, what's happening in our environment. And it is one thing after the other. So there comes a time where we have to say, this is affecting us and we have to be honest about it. Domestic violence has increased, right? More people are experiencing depression and suicide. Let's not forget how much alcohol has been consumed and purchased over the last year. People are trying to find ways to cope. And even in communities of faith who have done virtual worship well, their attendance is up. We're looking for ways to deal because it's too much, but we have to be brave enough to say it's too much. So for those of you who would be interested, you can take a look at the Brene, if you go to brenebrown.com, um, she's got really great podcasts, books, info hubs that talks about authentic living. Um, and I think that it's, those are valuable resources right now. Like I said, we need the emotional language and intelligence to help get us through this time. Can I share something that you just said, Tessa? And I, I applaud you for sharing that. And something that Tracy said earlier as well is about being in a leadership position and having to take care of your staff and also finding the space to take care of you as well. And as we were preparing to go back into this week, um, my, my natural instinct is, is my authenticity, is to, is to be a bottom liner. And so I sat with my team and I said, I don't really wanna to talk to y'all when I get in at 9.30 because this is my first time getting back into public transportation. This is my, my, like I've taken it here and there but I've not been in it. And not to say I don't wanna to talk to you guys but I just need that I need to transition from commuting to coming into the office and having that space. And I want you to have that too. I want you to be clear about what you're feeling, what you're experiencing, where you are in this time. And we did this exercise and we're going to keep it until the end of next week. We're not having meetings before 10 o'clock. And we did an inventory of the meetings. So I have a very small team, we're small but mighty, but I'm in a lot of different meetings. And so we did an inventory of our calendars. And where there are two or three of us in a meeting, we figured out, do all three of us need to be there? 
or can one can we swap in and out of these meetings and so this way we create the spaces in our calendars that other people don't necessarily respect uh, and not to say that they're just being they're just ignoring our spaces but this is kind of like the space that we've created in this virtual context where there's a meeting after the meeting after the meeting after the meeting and for me you know i was taking the laptop going off camera into the kitchen to just i just need a drink of water in between all these meetings i i'm the parent that was home i've worked from home but i've worked from home with a child with special needs and so Someone said earlier, you know, stepping up the game and going and be, I was the teacher, the tutor, the lunch lady, you know, I was all of those, those folk and still needed to be present, you know, for my work and for my team. So we, we are, we adopted some practices this week just to be mindful. And even as a leader, I had to be honest with my team and say, I have a lot of, I'm, I'm experiencing a lot in myself of coming back into the office. So this is one of the ways that I can be present for you is that I have to be present for me first. I have to clear, clear out my head. I have to clear the space and then I can be present for what we need to, for what we need to do. And, 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 and today was just a really, it's just, it's been a partly sunny, partly cloudy day. Right. And just coming back, taking a moment um, and figuring out even who's comfortable having someone visit them at their desk. And being honest about, I don't really want, you know, I have a staff person that said, can I move my desk to the end of the row? Because we have a cubicle farm as well, because I'm really not comfortable with people passing by me and I'm not ready for visitors yet. That's her truth. And so I have to support that as, as, as her supervisor, as her manager, um, and, and we have to figure it out. If I, if I could jump in real quick, Aris, thank you for that. Um, that was super, super powerful. I always had this thing, right? Uh, be careful when you're living in a space of consistent resiliency, because then you don't have like space to just rest, right? Like there, there's a time where you just need a little break for yourself. And um, we were having some um, a part in the Zoom chat, whatever. And um, I was saying this is the first time that some people are going to be around 25 people or more in one space. And then Jose responded back. This is the first time that some people are going to be away from their kids, but like in a year, in a year's time, right? And so I actually want to um, pass it over to Jose, if you could just elaborate on that and just what's happening on that end, especially as you deal with the youth in, in that level of community. Yeah, I'm um, speaking to some college students, actually, you know, um, the semester started at BCC a few weeks back, but they have like a fall two term coming up that just started today. And um, the, the changes, the policies that happened at BCC, you know, um, at first, students were able to just go on campus with a negative test. And then, you know, in the same, literally the same day, they dropped another email. Okay, no more, that doesn't, you can't do that anymore. Students have to be vaccinated. The amount of students that were like, I am not getting vaccinated because I cannot go into campus. I have my kids, you know, it's, it's what do we do as their advisors and as their, you know, guidance and do we tell them don't go to college just stay home like it, it's hard for us to make the right decision for them because you don't want them to risk you know their health or anything but we do have to listen to them and and, and try our best to still be able to serve them and, and give them the right let me not say advice but the right resources you know so usually what I do is I always I'm their voice that's usually my job at Future Now. A lot of our students don't know how to speak for themselves. So I'm their voice. So I'll write emails to their professors explaining their situation. You know, some of the students are just like, hey, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go back into campus. I can't leave my daughter. You know, a lot of our students have um, you know, uh, kids with special needs. I also have a, a son of my own who's autistic. So it's it's even something new for me and like going back to work and leaving my son home. It's, it bothers me at times because I've spent so much time with him and seeing his progress from, you know, first getting his diagnosis and then all the, all everything we did, you know, now it's like, I can't be there anymore, you know? So it's hard because, you know, I get emotional just talking about it because it's like, I don't know what, what's going to happen with my baby boy you know? So 
It's stuff I speak to my director with all the time, who I love her to death. She's amazing, Elizabeth Payam. So she's always, Jose, if you got to work two weeks, I mean, two days out of the week, and, you know, you can spend two days at home with your son, you know, it, it, it means a lot. But I have that choice, and I have a supervisor who's given me that option. Our students don't have that choice, you know? Like, I have students who I have, they have to go to work, and, you know, they have to pay the bills, but now they have to leave their kids. You know, there's some people who really don't have an option. And they, someone said it, they be strong, not because they, it's because they're forced to be strong. You know, they're forced to make these decisions. And I think that's one thing that it's happening now, but I just, I'm interested in how it's going to affect these kids in the long run in the future, how this small 18 months is going to affect them when they're five, six years old, seven years old. You know, I have a, a, a older daughter. She's about five or six. She's really antisocial now. But before the pandemic, this, my daughter was so friendly. She always wanted to meet new people. Now, anyone new, she doesn't even say a word to them. And I know it's because of, you know, the isolation, you know, and, um, I just wish, you know, thinking about the pandemic, it's, it's, it's funny how, you know, we, we had, I worked at Future, I'm, I've been working with Future now for about six years now. And I was, I'm used to the office. The office was never an issue for me. Never, never an issue. But after this 18 months, I'm like, I, do I really want to go back to a computer again? Like, I'm so used to a certain system now it's, it's you questioning what you were used to before. You know, I was used to taking the bus. Do I really want to get on the bus? I have to do that again. So now it's questioning everything that you were used to. Now you have to take the step back. And, and I think it's easier for us as adults and as professionals, but I know it's more complicated for our young adults who don't have the option and they just have to make those decisions. I want to shift a little bit because um, because of time frame also, but also want to talk about uh, being a caregiver during this time and having to make a shift as a caregiver to our younger ones, but to our parents and our elderly uh, people that are in our lives too, that are still depending on us. Uh, and while we transition back to work, uh, and I was just thinking about when when uh, when people were talking about how are we going to really be at work and be present at work when we're worried about our loved ones and what's happening with them. Are they next to somebody coughing on them? Are they in a place that's not safe for them? You know, once again, how are we gonna cope with that at work and worrying about our loved ones, especially our elders who are who we maybe caregive. I know Mike and Jerry and I, we were talking, uh, I think a day or two ago, and you know, we're all at the stage now, we're all caregiving. Uh, at the same time, parenting and doing many other things. But um, so I, I just want to start talking about that because we have an older set of, of people responsible to we're, we're working with now also. I care give my mom. She just turned 86. So as I said, parenting a young adult and then a mom who's 86 and watching what this change has been for her. So the COVID lockdown has not been good for my mom. All right, let's just say that the things that were part of her routine are gone. So she was not able to go to church and she was not able to go to her senior center. And those were the things that meant a lot to her as a retired um, person, right? And so it became, we had to find a way, I'm the youngest of five girls, and I, we had to find a way to, to engage my mother. So early on, we started talking about getting her an iPad and she was like, I don't want anything to do with that I thing. And she was like, I don't want the I thing, right? And so we got her an iPad. We were able to show her to, how to at least FaceTime. And I remember the first time that she FaceTimed family members and she, were able, she was able to see grandkids. Changed the whole ball game, right? Um, however, it's been a struggle for her because she lives alone. And I'm constantly, you know, like, what am I going to do? I, I buy her groceries. I send them by Instacart. I put a ring doorbell on her door so I can see who's ringing her bell. And yes, I do sit at work because I've been at work. 
and I'm like checking in with my mom throughout the day, it is not easy. I worry more about my mother than my young adult in the world because of her being the age that she is. So it's being a part of the sandwich generation. I don't like being squeezed. So I had to tell my daughter, I said, the less I have to be concerned about you, the more I can think about your grandmother. So she's like, don't worry, mom, take care of grandma. (laughs) So parenting, I I call it parenting my mom. And my mom is the hard head kid. (laughs) She don't want to listen all the time, right? And so that's my challenge. And the stress that comes with that Let's just say, I'm going to resort to a church phrase. Those that know the words of prayer, pray for me. (laughs) Kirsten, I see you over there shaking your head. Go ahead, take it. Go ahead. I'm just saying it's, it's not a reasonable ask. It's not a reasonable ask to have to come back to work and have things be fine. To be thinking about your mom, to be thinking about your kids, um, you know, Jose, your little one, um, who you spent, it's not a reasonable ask. And I think, you know, the messaging that I see on television, like, New York is back. I'm like, well, not quite. We're not quite back yet. It's nice that you say that, but so it's like, stop with the messaging around. It's being a new normal. Stop with the messaging around. We're all back because we're not. Um, I need to be coaxed out of my silo again. And so um, I just think the more we can, you know, do, you know, I think it was you, or least you were saying, don't talk to me in the morning. The more that we can empower the folks that are around us and the folks that we supervise and even remind our leaders. I need, I need a moment here. This is not a reasonable ask of you. I've been through a once in a century issue. We've all been through this, this happened once in a century issue. And now suddenly we're back. So that's just, I feel really passionate about, about that. To, it's, I'm glad that we're in a place where we're able to start to see the silver lining. That's wonderful. But I don't want to forget the sadness that we all carry and the fear that's still there. And, and at least I was just thinking about have schools in, in Head Starts and daycare, have they thought about putting cameras in the class so parents could, could kind, of, kind of ease their uh, anxiety about their children where they may be able to uh, virtually check in just to say, hey, I, I see my child, they're okay. Have they thought about you know, any of that? You know, that hasn't come up yet. Um, ironically, and also cameras in the classroom, or at least in the early childhood classrooms have always been um, something to consider. And I think that there's some like legalities around that or, or uh, safety concerns about that, but that has not come up yet. Um, you know, I think what, what parents are more concerned with in this present moment right now is seeing the the PPE in the rooms is seeing, uh, knowing what the cleaning schedule is going to be and all that, that, that those things. But the, the pieces around cameras have not yet come up. And I think mostly because at least in early childhood, there are some concerns about safety and access and things like that and seeing the children uh, and not being able to safeguard that in a particular way. Tessie, you wanna jump in? I saw you put something in the chat. There's also privacy issues involved. That's completely so that's, it, yes. Right, that's one of the reasons why you, you don't have cameras in the classroom the way you can just yeah. look in. Like we yeah. also still have to even manage um, with social media and taking pictures, right? So just because I allowed you to take a picture of my with my child, with your child, doesn't mean that I give you that expressed uh, permission to post my child on your social media. And so the cameras and all of that has just been a, a, it's not come up. I'm a little bit grateful to, if I'm being transparent, that it's not come up because I think it will just move us into some other spaces that, that we'll have to do a lot of work around. I think um, Arlise brought up a good point about um, uh, informing parents about how we're doing business now. 
Um, your, your video was wonderful. And a lot of our providers in after school did the same thing. Um, and they posted it on their website. This is what we're doing now. This is how we do it. And this is how we keep your, your children safe because they're, they are concerned. And it's, it's about not having the information. Um, so the more we can expose them on the safety measures that are in place and, um, and, you know, and, and how it's, and, and, and really showing them. And so the, the virtual world has been a godsend, um, you know, with that, because we can expose them um, in ways that we haven't done it, done before. And so a lot of our providers have posted videos and parents can see that on their website, you know, whenever they, they need to. Um, it's much better than a, a letter going home and a manual going home, listing all these things when they can see kids, you know, in mass, washing their hands and singing songs. And it just makes it, um, you know, more digestible for parents. No, I, I appreciate I, that. I'm sorry, I just wanted to say, and there's a lot of anxiety amongst parents. You know, um, like Jose said earlier, that the parents are experiencing separation anxiety. It's not just the kids, yeah. right? And so we have to be mindful of that, you know, that it, it's not easy. I, I think about me taking my daughter the first day to school and it wasn't in a pandemic and I'm the one who walked away and cried, right? <laughs> so, I can, so I can imagine how difficult this is for parents, you know? So Jose talking about that just reminded me of all of that. We, we once again, we have to be very caring and, and embrace the fact that this is, this is a trial for all of, all of us. A, Many uh, parents don't have it, the luxury. They have to, you know, they need the the child care um, and they have to, you know, go to work. And um, and, um, and so that just heightened their anxiety, right? Like, I, I don't want to do this, but I have to right. because I have to live in. Going so back to, to, to our to beloved seniors that you brought up, Scott, something that came up in a conversation a couple of weeks ago, um, because a lot of times when the opportunity presents itself for our grandparents to be able to be supportive in that way and help to take the children to school or pick them up or be a part of that structure, it, it dawned on us that that's, that's, a, that's a layered concern as well. Because while I have that support net, how comfortable am I now with my mom or my dad being out, taking my kid, going into being exposed? Like that's another layer of, of concern that did come up. Um, and then there's that duality of the grandparents wanting to be engaged and, and wanting to go back to having this space about, you know, being engaged with their, with their grands that they have been. And so one of the parents in our policy council was asking, were we going to return back to the parent, the grandparent support groups that Head Start used to have, because the grandparents are feeling a lot of different things, isolation, anxiety, and all of that. Um, and then on the other side of that, the sandwich crew, right? Like we're concerned about, you might be anxious, but I need you to be home and be safe. And so I'll do the drop off or maybe you can do the drop off and I'll do the pickup, but I don't necessarily want you to do both because I don't want you to have that level of exposure. And, and so it's, it, I, I don't have an answer, but it was something that came up with our, one of our parents. And I was like, wow, that's something that we had not thought about. And, and so how do we support our beloved seniors and, and, and still feeling connected, feeling needed and, and, and wanting to do this, but we as the, the children of these parents wanting them to be safe as well. Wow, and, and, you know, and I, I'm, I did it again. I see we're, we're almost at time and we're just like in the crux of, of some good conversation. And, and be able to really dig in a little deep. And unfortunately, I need everybody to, we have to start winding up. And I guess we want to try to leave our audience with some tips, as Kristen, you said, some nuggets to say, you know, here's something that you may want to try as we go into this new, this new world that we're going into and this new way of living. Here's a jewel. I love the affirmation that you said, uh, that's, that's one we have to put up and, and take with this. But for the rest of the panelists, if there's anything that we can suggest how to help people prepare for Monday morning at six o'clock in the morning, when they, well, maybe five o'clock in the morning as they're getting up preparing 
to make their sandwiches, their lunch, whatever, because now you can't even go out to lunch. Out there. You have to prepare yourself to take everything that you go because you have to sit at your desk and eat. You have to sit at your desk and communicate. And I was just thinking, how are we going to be doing all these Zoom meetings at our desk with all the noise that's going to happen <laughs> around our desk with you know, this person in the conference and on this side, this is another conference. I'm in a conference and you know, it's just going to be, everybody's going to be on computers and conferences in these, in these bullpens that we have. But if we can give any, our, our audience some tips and jewels that say, hey, here's something, uh, at least for my seat right now, I want to help give you this jewel to help you prepare for Monday, September 13th. Uh, so we'll start with Kristen, because you've been doing, you've been dropping some great jewels. So I'm going to let you throw out the first diamond. Okay. I mean, I go back to my affirmations and, um, one that I use for myself when I'm feeling scared, um, uncertain, I say, and this is rather bold, I am the sun. And that just tells me you can do this. You are bright. You are strong. You are warmth. You are all of those things. Um, so that's, that's what I'll leave you with. Thank you. Uh, Rod, oh. Rod uh, give, me, give us the last jewel. Give us a jewel uh, from me. Well, well, well look, look yeah, I don't really have a lot of jewels for you because I don't have a job, right? You know, so <laughs> I really don't know what to tell you, right? You know, other than to go into your own private uh, your business. But I will say this. I will say, Tessa, Tessa, you might be able to appreciate this, right? Routine. Routine, 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 right? So you get up in the morning, even if you're not going away, even for folks like me who are probably working as a consultant from home, right? There's certain things that you do that you want to set an example for yourself and other people in your family for, right? You know, so you get up at a designated time, you take care of yourself, you eat your food, you, you can't go to the gym, but you can work out, right? You can't go to church. But the church has told us, I might be shut in, but I'm not cut off from God. And so the books that we talk about, right, you know, I lean on the word of God, right? So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and I know who I am within Christ. And so my ministry at the Great Allen Cathedral tells me that I am not supposed to be ashamed of the gospel, and I can tell you that right now. And I can tell you that now where I may not be, have been able to tell you that years ago where someone said, oh, you can't say that church and state is that and the other thing i'm not tripping <laughs> i know exactly who i am and how i make it through a very very rugged society that we live in i cannot afford it right there's too much at stake for me right you know i mean there's a lot of things to get done so that's it in a nutshell for me i get up i grab that word somebody else might grab something you know from a motivational speaker but you know i grab something every day that supports what I believe in and something that allows me to be able to say, I believe something good gonna happen to me today. <laughs> Thanks, Rod. It's funny because Mike and I have been talking about we, we want to have a, a, a barbershop on religion. We just can't figure out how to get it done. <laughs> so, oh man, come on, man. Oh, 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 <laughs> see, I mean, but but men, come on, Scott. No, but we Mike and I know we, we nothing we like want, men coming men to the have this conversation. We're trying to get up. <laughs> this is the only time we can come out as men of color with both hands up and say, I surrender without someone saying up against the wall. Right, Jerry? <laughs> well, Jose, I'm going to let you go next with that, Rod. Um, I think just pace yourself. You know, everyone is, um, everyone has their, a different situation. You know, um, each staff member from the, supervisor down you know directors everyone has their own life situation and you just have to pace your own self and mentally prepare not just physically but mentally prepare on going back to the office you know if it doesn't work for you going five days a week you have to speak up and and you know hopefully they listen to you but you know just speak up and understand you have to pace your own self you know when we when we went from being in the office till out of the office we weren't just on zoom the next day you know we had to pace ourselves okay how are we going to be meeting are we going to do conference calls our conference phone calls ended up to us learning how to use zoom 
you know, a bunch of us became tech, tech, tech savvy and all of us know how to troubleshoot things online that we didn't do before. We'll just, you know, call BCC and have the tech people come up, but just pace yourself and understand not only physically you're going back, but mentally you're going back and just you keep control of your own pace. Elise? I was thinking and I prepped the preparation, right? And so what does that mean? That means whatever it takes for you parents to get yourselves prepared for six o'clock. You might have to prepare on Sunday or well, in my world, I have to prepare Friday and Saturday, right? Because I need to get all the things that I need to get for him ready and then get all my things ready. And so prep the preparation and be present to what you're experiencing and what you're feeling. And if it means take a breather, take a minute, you know, it, that's what it is. So prep for the preparation, be present to who you are, be present to the moment that you're experiencing um, and, you know, hopefully there's another opportunity to do it right again. If you don't get it right the first time, same thing we tell our children, right? Try and try again. Or if you first, if you don't succeed, you can try it again. That's where, that's where I am, to be honest. It's, it's, I'm prepping the preparation. I'm not stressing if I don't get it right uh, in this moment. And we, we, we have a conversation. And, okay, well, what can we do to get it better the next time? And we try it again differently. Um, so Monday morning, I will be preparing starting Friday night, labeling all the stuff that has to go into the backpack and, <laughs> you know, figuring out what's going to be for lunch for him, for me, and what are our clothes going to be like. All of this is, is, is pacing, like you said, Jose, pacing myself and prepping myself for Monday morning. Trace? You're muted, Trace. Um, I think my my advice to parents would be recognize when you need help, you know, that you are um, not expected to know everything when you need to know it, to be able to accomplish things when it needs to get done. And it's okay to ask for help and support. Um, it is uh, true that saying, you know, it takes a village and, um, and, you know, so reach out to those in your circle, um, you know, when you feel like you're overwhelmed. Um, and uh, if you don't have a circle, like, fig, you know, find one, and call, you know, call, there's, a, there's resources out there um, and, um, you know, seek them out and try to get support for your yourself um, because you can't support your children if you're if you're not well um, and so you know a lot of times we 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 don't do that you know even non-parents like you know we feel like we um, we have to do it all and I know for myself as a leader I've become comfortable with like I don't know <laughs> I, I, I don't know right now um, and you um, you know, I'm going to try to find out and I'm going to try to figure it out. And I, I, I feel like folks respect that, you know, um, you know, when you're, you're open as a leader, you're open and you're, you're telling, you're, you're showing how vulnerable you are, um, but that you're putting in that effort to try to figure it out. But at this moment, I don't know. And I, and I, and I used to beat myself up about it because I'm supposed to have all the information and I'm supposed to be able to provide it uh, when it's needed. And sometimes that's just not the case. And, um, and I don't feel bad about it. Thanks, Trace. Uh, I'm coming over to your meeting. So I'll be over next week. <laughs> so, and uh, Tessa, uh, I know you're in a new job. I know you got a lot to, to go, but I'm giving you the final word of the panel. Go right ahead. Well, there's been so many great gems that we wrapped up with. So mine is going to be fun. As I shared earlier, I'm a jazz lover. So mine is music and movement. And there's a lot of scientific um, proof that music changes mood, right? But so does movement. It allows the body to get rid of some of the angst and some of the anxiety and worry. So um, one of the things that I, I grew up doing, like so many of us, is when we would clean the house, we put on the oldies, we dance around, we clean. And then as a result, we didn't mind that we were cleaning so much. So I'm going to suggest that on you know, getting ready Monday morning, put on some, some, good mu some good mood music and get your kids ready 
you know, so um, let them experience an oldie, something that you enjoy, play it for them, sing it with them, make it your song. And as a result, it'll change the mood and set the tone for the day. You know, I really do believe like Rodney said, he said, I'd appreciate, you know, the fact that we're talking about having a schedule, some kind of regiment, you know, um, and if you incorporate this into your day, you'd be surprised how much that music can influence your little ones. So I did a lot with my daughter. So it's really funny because there's moments she's tossing me old songs from the 70s, even though she's in her early 20s, because those are the songs we sang to, right? So there were moments I'd pick up the hairbrush and I'm Diana Ross and she got to be the Supremes. But that made it so that by the time she was dancing and moving on her way out the door, she was in a great mood. And so was I. It's funny when you said that, I thought about that Roberta Flack album my mom used to put on Saturday morning. And that means everybody up and clean the house. You got to go clean the house. <laughs> and the house better be clean before the album ends. So, you know. <laughs> so I want to thank all our panelists. Uh, this has been an outstanding conversation. I hope our viewers got some tips and jewels. And I hope it helps prepare everybody uh, to get ready to go back to work. So, uh, Jerry, how you feeling, man? Man, I feel great. As always, my, my plate is full. I want to thank all the panelists uh, and I champion everybody out there listening, all the panelists um, who are caregivers to their children, caregivers to, um, to their elders, um, those special needs. Just I champion everybody because if you made it here, because a lot of people who didn't, I just champion you, right, to get to this next step. Also, if I had to leave anything that I got, one, being mindful of when you're living in a space of consistent resiliency. One thing that COVID taught us is to pause, right? And in that space, acknowledge your truth. Um, I love what Rodney said, pace yourself so you can protect yourself. And I would add a little sprinkle to give yourself a little bit of grace because we're all trying to figure it out. And then finally, continue to find innovative ways to continue to, I wanna say, um, discover your new self. Like this is all new and there's a lot of new things that we've discovered in each other. Continue to find innovative ways. I love what Kirsten said, maybe it's headphones, uh, maybe it's jazz, whatever that is, don't be afraid to discover it so you can hold on to it as that new tool going into the fall. Thank you. Thanks, I'm gonna pass over to Shepard Mike. Mike uh, Shepard. <laughs> there's, um, it, looking at the time, there's so many things I'd like to say and I have to restrain myself and I've probably, I've tried to listen carefully, but I've edited in my head about four different things that I could say. So, um, for several months now, I try to pick something that somebody has already said. I said, that's kind of from the top rope. They're like, they really delivered it. There are many things that were said, but two that stand out for me. Um, Kirsten was saying earlier, we're learning to fly during a storm. And it's enough just being a passenger when there's a storm, because there's turbulence, and you know, you're heading in a direction and you're sort of nervous and I want to make it, you know, but like, on top of that, learning how to fly during a storm, you really have a lot to, to manage and to take on. I, I think the, the nugget from that, um, and there's many, there's many gems that Tracy dropped along the way. We talked a lot about being a manager too and, and supporting your staff, or at least talked a lot about that. And I was listening and then I got in my head a little bit because I was thinking about um, everyone who's listening and, and not everyone who's listening may be uh, a manager, but the truth is we're all managers of our own lives. So whether you have a lot of paid employees, or you don't have a lot of paid employees, you've got kids, you've got neighbors, you've got a, 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 like, I, I could have talked for 10 minutes about the elder, el, the adult caregiving stuff that I'm going through right now. I didn't even, we didn't have time. You know what I mean? We were all managing our lives. And so I thought about, Several a uh, couple of months ago when we were doing financial literacy, and during that discussion, someone said we're used to this phrase keeping it 100, but let's talk about keeping it 700. So you need to shift your conversations around those high credit scores, and that will orient your thinking. That will reorient the conversations you're having with people. And um, you know, and I yeah, not that this is going to stick with her, but I, I started thinking about having a 360 view while we're trying to fly this plan you got to look behind you what life was like in march of 2020 
you've got to look ahead. Next week is ahead, but then there's next month and there's next year that I, but you also have to look to your left and your right, like everyone that's traveling with you, everyone that's trying to go in the same direction that you're going. Uh, it, Jerry pointed to grace and that has been popping up a lot. I actually just came, uh, Boston hosted a national poverty alleviation conference. And so we're talking about all these strategies and how people have had to adapt services or whatever. But a lot of the conversations are about how hybrid is here to stay in one way or another and the need for grace and some forbearance and patience with one another. And I think I've heard every person at some point this evening talk about how important it is to check in with yourself, be transparent with yourself and with others, try to model for your loved ones in the midst of all the turbulence and all the things that are happening at least we know this so far. So let's do this. Try to make intelligent decisions based on the information you have so far. Try to keep people safe and try to keep people uh, who, who are dear to you and you love, uh, you know, moving forward, you know. And, um, and the last thing I'll say, and I, I, I'm glad Rodney was with us because he was saying he can say things that, you know, some of us when we work inside of some of these institutions can't say. But the whole thing about sometimes you got to put your hands up and uh, it's not because the police are asking you to. Whoever your higher power is, this has been a great time to check in again with your higher power. And uh, and it's never too late, whatever that means for you, for you to to do that. And I think that that's part of the this 360. I didn't know when we do this that we were going to have to do like a whole other hour and a whole other session or whatever. Oh, this is the last, last thing I said, and then I really <laughs> stopped, right? I was excited to do this, but I was nervous to do this for a while because from about June last year until whatever, there was a time long ago when I thought, oh, well, whenever we do the session about going back to work, that will be the end of the barbershop talks. I used to think that. I don't think that anymore. I mean, everybody knows that, you know, and someone's in the chat saying, don't forget to let people know September 28th. Don't under underestimate your emotional, social, mental resiliency. So whatever this new normal is, we have to carry some of the stuff that we've adapted along with us. We're all convinced someone is listening <laughs> and, and benefiting when we're having these conversations. So if the barbershop talks are going to continue, then a lot of the other stuff we've been doing for the past year, year and a half, we need to find a way to have it continue even while we go and do whatever else is part of the, you know, new normal or, you know, I will, I, I have a whole thing about the word normal. I, we don't have enough time to, to get into right now we just focus on the on the new so whatever the new is we have to bring some of what has worked along uh with us and be patient with one another while we're doing it thanks mike um as mike said uh next on the 28th of this month we're going to be having our next barbershop talk and it's understanding your emotional social mental resiliency and we're going to have a star-studded panel panel uh, with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Gardier, Lisa Lavelle, uh, Olympic star Wendy Hilliard, uh, Brett Scudder, and others that we're still waiting to hear. So we have a great star-studded uh, panel coming to talk about that. Uh, talk about that with mental health and being resilient, because as I think Rodney or somebody said earlier, that we that you know we we have to be resilient, be able to pivot, and keep moving. Uh, we can't be. We can't stay stuck in the mud where we're at, but we have to be able to be resilient, pivot, and keep it moving. And we as a people have been done, have done that for hundreds and hundreds of years that we've been able to pivot and keep it moving. Uh, no matter what happens, what comes up in our lives, we've been able to be resilient and keep it going. Uh, our, our ancestors done it, uh, and we're doing it, and we have to get it prepared for the next generation because at this point, we have to pivot and keep it moving. So as we wrap up today, the barbershop, we want to leave you with some nuggets. Like Mike said, when you're flying into that storm, make sure you do a 360, look behind you and understand what you've gone through to get you to the point you're at now. Look ahead of you, where you want to go and where you want to be and what you want to plan to do to get there. And then also look to the right and to the left of you and also make sure the people next to you are helping you and helping them get to where you have to go to. So we have an opportunity at this time and be graceful with people that we're going to be around because you never know 
who has what and what people are going through and what people may be having anxiety about as you go on the train and subway and be just mindful that this person may be just having a bad day. And you know what? And I got to be nice enough and I got to be mature enough to understand, you know what? They're just having a bad day. They may have some anxiety. Let me be compassionate right now as we go to set, go into this new, into this new way of living and be compassionate for this person next to me because we don't know what they're going through. If you're able to be able to, to get through it, to have some sense of self-worth, self-mind, self-affirmation that you can do to help you survive the day, maybe help give the next person, that person who's next to you that you see on the subway, that you see in a train, or that coworker next to you, maybe you can help give them some comfort from what you have known or what you have learned to help them. That's what the real world is. That's what we really should be doing here as a people. You know, they always talk about what you know on your headstone talks about your beginning and your end, but the most important thing is that dash in the middle, what you've done and what you have done for others, not only for yourself, but sometimes we are so stuck in about me, 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 but what are you doing for others? That's very important. Those of you know that that's what's going to get the jewels in your crown on the other side. So if you don't do that, you won't have no jewels on your crown on the other side. So please, everybody, be safe, mask up test negative, and be positive. Once again, thank you for here at the Barbershop. We love you. We'll see you at the end of this month. And we appreciate all of our panelists who have come today. We want to give you a, a round of applause and we thank you. And we want you to be safe also. All right, good night, panelists. Just hold on for a second as we wrap